text from 1 Corinthians 15.55 this morning. 1 Corinthians 15.55. 1 Corinthians 15.55. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? This morning, with the help of the Holy Ghost, I'll be preaching on this thought, the sting of sin. The sting of sin. Let us bow our heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and there's none like you, Lord. Now, once again, we come before your throne rebuking every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray, Lord, that you place a special hedge of protection around about us, the church here. Let no evil, even our wickedness, penetrate, Lord. I pray, Lord, that our hearts and our minds will be plowed, that they would be good soil for your word to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that it would take root in our hearts, that we would be transformed to your very image, even farther. Anoint my mind and my lips to bring forth your words, we pray. We ask for all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The sting of sin. We're not going to be focusing on the whole verse of 1555 of 1 Corinthians, but we're going to be focusing on that very first question. O oh, death, where is thy sting? It's interesting because according to Jameson's Fawcett Brown's uh, commentary, they state that when you look at this question, it's a legal question, like that which would be used in a lawsuit. So when we talk about, oh, death, where is I sting? It's not like me coming up to Brother Ken and saying, Brother Ken, where did you put the mustard? But rather, it is a legal process that there is someone on trial at this point in time. There is something very serious going on. It's an urgent matter. Oh, death, where is thy sting? It is almost as if death himself is being placed on trial here, and he is already taken the stand, and he's being questioned by the prosecutor. Oh, death, where is your sting? If we look at this question here, there are two main nouns that we see mentioned, and that is death and sting. And when we look at that word sting, our minds probably begin thinking maybe about a, a few animals that might possess this sting. Perhaps we go back to our childhood where maybe once we were stung by a bee, or maybe we were stung by the poison of a snake and it bit us and it hurt, or maybe a bite of a, a spider. But there's a connotation that brings us back to that word sting. It's not something pleasant. It's not something enjoyable. But if you're stung with something, typically it is a time of pain. And for a police officer going through training when they get hit with that taser for the first time, it's not something enjoyable, but I'm sure there's a sting that comes with it that every time maybe you hear that sound, you begin to cringe for a little bit. That word sting comes with a connotation not of a joyful experience, but of a painful experience. So it's as if death brings a painful experience. When we look at this passage of 1 Corinthians 15, 55, it indicates that death possesses a sting. There's a sting that comes with death. But we have to remember, death did not always exist in this world. Death had a beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And when we get to the end of the six days, the Bible states, not like God did with the other days that he looked at it was good. But after the sixth day, God looks back and he says it's very good. In fact, it brings a connotation that God looks back and it's perfect. There is no flaw in any of his creation. It is perfect in every way. God goes on to create the garden for Adam and Eve. And it was perfect. There were no flaws. Then one day, a creature comes on the scene. A creature that we can associate with the sting itself. The serpent. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field 
which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the women, Yea, hath God not said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? See, there was no sting right here. The serpent possessed the sting. But the sting has not been brought forth. He was nudging to that point. The Bible says that he began to talk with Eve. You realize there's no sting when the devil comes to talk to us. There's a sting that comes after once he introduces the poison. The poison had not really been introduced yet. The poison had not been experienced yet. But rather God's whole creation was perfect yet. And the serpent... And the serpent here is not like a serpent we think of today. Because at this point, he still had his legs. He hadn't been cursed yet. But the Bible says that he was beautiful. He was more subtle. He was cunning. He knew what words to say. But when the devil got a hold of the serpent, those enticing words, those cunning words, got twisted. They got perverted. No, what he wasn't saying was bad. But it's one of those, Sister Laura, why don't you just go out and steal from that grocery store down the place? They won't miss that candy bar. You haven't experienced the pain yet from the sting, but it's just getting there. It's that talk. How many times in our life have we messed up in our Christian walk and it began when we began listening to the voice of the devil? You know, the sting wasn't there yet. We hadn't experienced the punishment for falling yet, as far as failing God goes, we haven't felt that guilt in our life for failing God, that guilt of sin, but rather, he's there, and he's talking. You know, as far as we are in our Christian walk, we should know better than to listen to any time the devil wants to start talking to us, because it always comes with a price and a penalty. But here in the garden, death had not entered into the world yet. But the devil is on the scene, working through that serpent, and he's talking to Eve. Something that seems so innocent. And they go back and forth, down to two and through five. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch of it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in that day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The devil and Eve are just talking, going back and forth. And at this point, everything is so perfect in the world. But the devil starts getting to Eve. And he didn't bring up the knowledge of the, tr the tree of the knowledge of good or evil. He just started enticing her, getting the wheels turning, getting her thinking. And she said, Yea, God has said, We shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. And we go throughout the Word of God. We do not know if Eve got those words from God himself or if Adam passed them on. Because we don't have any direct indication that God spoke these words to her directly. But the truth of the matter is, she still had the word of God. She still knew better. But the serpent was there using what she knew and began working it against her. And the woman was aware that the deadly bite was being introduced. But she was thinking. And the devil was talking. You know, how many times in our life have we gotten in trouble when somebody else was trying to entice us to do something and they were talking and making us think? And that's exactly what's going on here. The world's perfect. Death had not been introduced. But the devil's just trying to get her to go towards the sting, that deadly bite, and it was introduced. In 1 John chapter 2, and verse 16, the Bible states, For all that is in the world, the lust of the eye, the foot, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life is not a thought is not of the father but is of this world you realize that's when we begin getting in trouble in our christian walk when we get our eyes off of our of off of christ and we begin getting our eyes enticed it may not be everything all at once 
But we begin looking at those things that we shouldn't. We begin looking at, well, how can that person claim to be a Christian be living that way? How can God be blessing them and how can God be honoring them? How are they doing those things? And we do not realize the pain and the suffering that maybe they're going through or is on their way because of the consequences of their sin. <clears throat> but once we move from the lust of the eye, we begin feeling how we want to partake in that. And then we push it a little bit farther. And then finally, we get to the pride of life. Shall, if you, in that day that you eat them, you shall be as gods. And your eyes shall be opened. And when we get to the pride of life, who's God to tell us what to do? What's it going to hurt? Or we get into the downfall of so many other Christians. Well, I'll do it and I'll ask for repentance later. Or there'll be ministers out there that will tell you, well, you can go out on that sin. Just make sure you come back on Sunday and repent. That is not the word of God. That is that sting of death being introduced to you. And it's a matter of getting you to take your steps forward to get to the point where you get stung. And you experience the pain that comes along with it. See, Eve went through all of this. The lust of the eye. You know, that fruit. It looked desirable to her. It was something she never had before. Who knows? Maybe she was hungry. Does not things look differently when we're hungry? What's one thing you don't do when you're hungry? You don't go grocery shopping. Because you'll throw everything in the cart. Why? looks good to the eye, and your flesh is telling you, you want that, you want that. Perhaps that was what going, that's what, that is what was going on here with Eve. For whatever reason, it looked good to her eye. There was nothing that, probably no bad spot. It looked like the perfect fruit. Then it came to the lust of her flesh. She desired the fruit. It was good to look upon. Maybe she thought, well, it doesn't look harmful. There doesn't look like there would be anything that would harm me. It looks perfectly fine to me. And then the pride of life to the point where maybe I don't see anything wrong with it. She decided to disobey, that she would disobey God. Maybe God doesn't know everything after all. Maybe God just does not want them to enjoy everything that this world has to offer. Does it not sound like the words of the devil? You know, go out and sin. Life, you have plenty of time to repent. You can repent on your deathbed. But yet no man knows the day or the hour when they shall die. And no man knows the day or the hour when Christ will re shall return. But the devil will tell you to go out and enjoy the things of this world. And enjoy it while you can. And he's gotten so many people that way. And they got stung. When you look at death entering into this world. You see it wasn't because Eve took the bite of the fruit. For Eve was deceived. The devil tricked her. But when she gave it to her husband, the devil didn't have to give him all those enticing words. Whether Adam was right beside her, or maybe he was off somewhere and she had to carry the fruit to her. The Bible says Adam knew exactly what he was doing. When he took the bite of that fruit, he knew exactly what he was doing. He didn't need the devil to entice him. He didn't need tempted. But he knew that, hey, I'll be as God. Who is God to tell me what to do? He was not deceived in any way, but he chose to eat the fruit in disobedience and willfully sin. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 14. And Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. See, when Adam sinned, some of, the, some of the sting of the sin was released in this world through death. <clears throat> Up to this point, man was created to live eternally. Your body was designed to never die, Sister Laura. No aging, no carpal tunnel, no arthritis, no pain. Man was to work. But there was no pain, there was no suffering. There was no death. There was no aging. But Romans chapter 5, verse 12 states, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. See, when Adam sinned, the sting of death was introduced into this world. 
death, disease, sickness, as much as even right now. If you were to blame COVID-19 for being man-made, that's fine. But you realize that man did not make COVID in the first place. Whatever you want to call it, it was released into this world because of sin. Just like Alzheimer's, just like um, any other thing you can think of, diabetes, all those diseases came as a result of sin. All the thorns, all the thistles, all that came by way of sin. Sister Beth was asking me last night, why do you think that God placed these thorns on the roses? Well, the answer is God didn't originally place those thorns on those roses. They are a byproduct of sin. Sin, a byproduct of death. Death released a sting upon each one of us. And with that sin came a death. Romans chapter 6 and 23 states, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin, death brought a sting that we all have to endure. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And each one of us right now, how we live our life, we are accruing a debt whether it's through sin, and we'll have to pay for that in the end, or whether we're adding up good things, all of those are going into an account to be paid out one day. And no one alive can escape it. Sin has a sting. And when we look at here in Genesis, the sting that the serpent introduced to Adam and Eve has been plaguing mankind from the moment that Adam ate of that fruit. Sin brought sting. But you realize that there is the sting of the Savior this morning. We get a glimpse of that in the Old Testament. And I didn't even realize it this morning when we were talking about it until we got to that point. But Hosea chapter 13 and 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from my eyes. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 55 is actually a fulfillment of this prophecy. But when we look at this prophecy, we find that the Savior has a sting. Jesus has a sting. And when we look at the Old Testament, Hosea refers to it not as a sting, but plagues. And people will argue, well, maybe we have to look at the Hebrew word to find out exactly what it means. Well, to surprise, surprise them, it means exactly what it means. If you look it up, it means literally pestilence or plagues. God himself is telling death, you may have a sting, but I will be like plagues. When we think of plagues, we go automatically back to Egypt and all those things that came upon the Egyptians. And all those things that took place, the death of the newborn, all those horrific things, lice being released, frogs being released, locusts being released. But Christ is telling death, it doesn't matter what your sting is upon mankind. My place will be worse for you. We first see this illustrated in the Old Testament when it comes to the brazen serpent that was, picked, that was a picture of Jesus Christ. In Numbers chapter 21 and verse 9, And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had been any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. See, there was a plague of serpents that came upon the Israelites in the wilderness. And the Bible describes the bite of the serpent as a fiery bite. It was painful. To put in uh, words of 1 Corinthians 15 55, it had a sting. But God instructed Moses to make a serpent of brass, and anyone that looked upon it would be healed. When we studied out that serpent, that brazen serpent on that pole, is a picture or a type of Jesus Christ. Just as that serpent provided deliverance because of the promise of God to anyone who looked upon it, so does Christ to 
for anyone that looks upon him for his work that he did upon the cross. Christ stung sin by taking those stripes upon his back for us, for our transgressions. He was wounded. We find this in first, um, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, with his stripes, we are healed. What were those stripes? That was a little bit of those plagues that he, Christ was going to place upon death. Because you see, disease, with death came disease. With death came sickness. But with the strength that Jesus Christ took upon those his back at the whipping post, they weren't for our salvation. They weren't even necessary for our salvation. <coughs> but they were Christ putting a little bit of the plague back onto death. 1 Peter verifies this in chapter 2, verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin would live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. When Christ took those stripes, that was one of the plagues that he was placing upon death. Christ goes, you may have placed sickness upon my people, but I'm going to buy it back for little by little that they may experience healing once again. He stoned sin again by shedding his blood on the cross for our sins. John chapter 19 and verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the, coat, gave up the ghost. See, Christ was the only acceptable sin offering who could redeem anyone from the grips of death and sin. You couldn't do it, and I couldn't do it. Even if we wanted to and said, Lord, I would have been willing and gladly to die on that cross for my own sins. Personally, I don't think I could have done it. And we go through that day of everything that Christ endured, the beating, the scourgings, the carrying your own being, the time on the cross, the pain, the agony, the thoughts of being nailed to it. I could have done it myself. But yet, Christ did it for us. And even if we could have gone through with it, we would never would have been an acceptable sacrifice. Because the Bible states that from the beginning, for all have sinned. We were already tainted with sin. We could not be that perfect sacrifice that was necessary for the redemption of sin. We could have never even been died for just us. We've already been tainted. But Christ did that for us. The Savior stung sin that we may be with him forever. In conclusion, as Sister Beth comes to the piano, in 1 Corinthians 15 55, O oh death, where is thy sting? We're looking at the rapture. And we're looking at the fulfillment of Hosea here in 1 Corinthians 15. But when we go back to the Old Testament, once again, all we see is the fact that Christ is saying, you may have tarnished my, sin, my, my creation. You may have stung my sons and my daughters. But I will play you harder than you would ever dream or imagine. And at this point, you shall experience the final play upon my people. For you cannot touch them anymore. For they are coming up to experience what I've already told them. That in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for them. It is fitting that plagues was used because sin released its own plagues upon mankind. It was as if death told the first Adam, I will be your plagues. I will be your sting. 
for the second Adam before death. You know what? I will be your place. I will be your state. Christ took those stripes and allowed his body to be broken for our healing. And he shed his blood on the tree for our sins. This morning, we're going to get ready to take communion. As we remember the work that Christ has done for us this morning. The sting of a Savior upon death. How he shed his own blood for our healing. And he shed his own blood for the redemption of our sins. He's done more than we could ever dream or imagine. But he's not above and beyond. And this morning, all I can hear is the words as if it was a father upon someone attacking his children. You may have done this, but I'll do far worse to you than you have ever done. This morning, as we get ready to humble ourselves, as we get ready to remember the work that Christ did for us, let us find ourselves a place of prayer and check ourselves that we are in right standing with Him. For we are instructed to check ourselves for introspection to make sure that we are in right standing with God whenever we are about to take communion. For there are many that have taken it unworthily. They take in it while they were knowingly living in sin. And because of that, not only are some sick, there were some that died. 